Welcome to day number two in our journey through all of Paul's letters. And today we're trusting that everyone's already read Romans chapter two and Romans chapter three. And we wanna constantly say this, just read them. Don't try to soak it all in or kind of have this guilty sense if you're not gathering in all the data. We just wanna make sure that all of us are reading all of Paul's letters. So Peter, after having looked at Romans chapter two and Romans chapter three, what are some of the highlights here? What's kind of that narrative that we need to be yeah. looking at? Well, as I said yesterday, Paul in the first chapter has sort of lulled his hearers into a false sense of safety, of portraying a uh, routinely familiar, again, for um, a particular sorts of Jews of this period, description of the Gentiles. But now he's gonna sort of like pull back the terrifying veil Right. which is that that depiction of the Gentiles isn't all that different from anybody else. Um, and so that's why he starts off on this diatribe against judging. What Paul is trying to do is say like, as true as this depiction of the godlessness of the Gentiles, and that's really what's going on, right? Is um, we see all that truth and godlessness language, right. which comes together around the notion of idolatry, the Gentiles, have sold the truth about God for a lie. That's idolatry. Right. And so God has given them over to f flesh out that idolatry in various ways. Correct. And now Paul's coming back to say, well, have you guys really done all that much better? Right. And what's- And we know in their history, they haven't. Right. Israel's history is not glowing when it comes to idolatry and the sins tied with it, right? Yeah, and then there's also at this period, um, some historic, some New Testament scholars have argued that this notion that um, the uh, ethnic Jews under Roman occupation, that a lot of them uh, describe their situation as precisely the kind of exile that in earlier Old Testament stories mm -hmm. um, witnessed to a kind of crisis in need of God's salvation. Right. That they felt themselves to be a part of that Old Testament story in this kind of pattern of like decline and restoration, right. waiting for a restoration. Which involves from, the Messiah. From Roman occupation. Right. right. And so what we have here um, is Paul trying to democratize Jew and Gentile alike as people in need of a renovative work from mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. And motivating that and what's going to come to the fore um, in chapter three more strongly is the instinct or the belief that just having the law doesn't make all the difference. Right. Paul's trying to challenge what you might call shallower notions of the law. Right. So it seems to be one of the things he's calling out is, well, some people who are ethnically Jewish at this period, assumingly go, well, I'm circumcised. I bear the identity marker and I'm have a child gone, of Abraham. I've gone through that yep. entry point into God's chosen people. Right. And uh, this makes all the difference. And Paul is saying, well, what good is an identity marker or one thing you did one time mm -hmm. if in fact you're not keeping the law on all these other points and worse, you're the one calling out the Gentiles right. for not keeping the law. Yeah. And so he's trying to expose a evaluation of circumcision of um, Jewish identity as um, in conflict with its own account of the law. And so by the end of chapter two, what we have is, um, by the end of chapters two and three, what we have is a notion of the law that's being used to knock down kind of uh, anybody's supremacy over the Gentiles, to democratize the human race, Jew and Gentile alike. Um, both of them standing before God. All have sinned. In need of yes. a particular work from Jesus. Right. And uh, how that work gets described is going to continue to be fleshed out, right. but it clearly has everything to do with faith. And so I think it'd be smart for us, Peter, just to look at Romans 3.1, because it says here, Paul writing, and remember, if 
our view of the book of Romans is he's writing to the Jews who are part of that Roman church and he's informing them about the Gentiles coming in. But what's fascinating about Romans 3, 1, and again, it's that thing where Paul doesn't abandon Judaism. He doesn't throw it all away and start a new thing. But in Romans 3, 1, he's, 3, 1, he says, what advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? And you would think that the next phrase should be zero. It's worthless. It's not what Paul says. Paul says much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. So again, Paul doesn't show up and start this new movement and just section it off from what's come before. Not at all. He's saying, nope, circumcision, um, that idea of being a Jew is awesome. And the very words of God have been entrusted to you. So he's yeah. not wiping out Judaism right. at all. And everything, we've talked about this a lot through Luke and Acts, the attempt to get a balanced vision. In 3.9, he's then going to go, what then? Are the Jews better off? No, not at all. Right. So a lot of people, I think, would look at this and be like, I, like, I just don't really understand what he's doing. But here's the two poles we need to hold together. The value of circumcision and the advantage of the Jew is much in every way. Mm -hmm. But the Jews are no better off. Yes. That's the sort of conflict. Right. And what Paul's, the bigger vision that some New Testament scholars suggest, the, or the conflict that Paul has, is a conflict that goes like this. God has given things of genuine benefit to his historic people. Yes. But his historic people find themselves in a situation that is not particularly better off than the Gentiles, as though they are less in need than the Gentiles are. Right. And so what we have here is this kind of, uh, it's a little bit greater gift, greater responsibility, lesser oh, gift, lesser responsibility. Yeah, no doubt. But it all comes out to the same thing. And so we're balancing this. What advantage has the Jew? Much in every way. God has been faithful to them and the given them the Torah. The word of God came through them. Yes. Yeah. And then are the Jews better off? No, all have sinned. Yes. Um, and so again, what Paul is trying to do is bring um, the whole human race to a level playing field. He's not trying to elevate the Gentiles and to motivate the Jewish people. It sounds like he's trying to de-inflate an over-inflated notion of what he might think circumcision is and then to bring that into a kind of right. empathy and community with the Gentiles so that everybody's in the same, we're on the same playing field, even if we might kind of be in different spots. Right, and I think it would be valuable if we actually read Romans 3, 9, he says this, what shall we conclude then? Do we, meaning the Jews, he's a Jew, do we have any advantage? No, not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. And so Peter, is there anything else that might be worth talking about at this moment? And you know what? I'm, I'm gonna maybe steer a little bit away from what we had planned. Talk to us just briefly, what is the power of sin? Oh, yeah. I think it would be great to hear this because a lot of times people feel like sin is something I do, which isn't totally inaccurate, but that's not what Paul's talking about yeah. when he's talking about the power of sin in verse number nine. Yeah, um, so maybe, uh, maybe the last point we can make, you know, huddle. Maybe the last thing we can say in this video is the power of sin and then the righteousness of God through faith because right. those are connected. Yeah, um, you know, a lot of American Christians, especially have, a, have an evangelical background, we lived through a theological change that happened um, in the 19th century uh, that you can see in the Wesleyan tradition in which sin becomes vice. Mm -hmm. So naughty things that individuals do or with individuals do with one another, that's sin or vice. Mm -hmm. But in the ancient world and in Paul's imagination, not in the sense that he imagined it, but just the way he imagined it. It's no his view. No one's seen the whole world, so we all right. have to imagine it. His imagination of the world, the world is under the power of this rebellious evil force yes. called sin. Right. You can sort of write sin with a capital S in yes. most of Romans. Right. Sin is almost a person. It's this power that's yep. out there. And if you think about the Old Testament, um, we start off with a story in which sin is represented in this 
talking snake. Mm -hmm. It's kind of aberration in eaten. nature. Yeah. And it, it approaches the mother of the living and tempts her to eat the fruit. And then yep. she and the man do that. Yep. Well, then in the next chapter, in the story between their sons, Cain and Abel, God said, sin couches at the door. It's urges towards you, but you must master over it. Right. Sin is in side of him. That's right. And then we're going to get these stories of violent cities where it turns out that sin is in the culture. Like right. sin is in the, the, the polis. And so sin is at us individually. It's in, in us. us. Yes. It's around us. It's in yes. our context. And, and it's so forming culture. This growing yes. monster Tower of, of Babel, sin. all of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, two resources that maybe we could link to uh, is um, the Bible Project has some good resources on yes. sin and its history. And if you yeah. want to take the academic dive, a New Testament scholar at Yale by the name of Matt Crosman recently published a book on sin in Romans as the cosmic tyrant. Yes. That's what he sees Which is a good book. Now, Peter, just for the sake of time, now let's go on to the next one. So oh, we yeah. know that, that sin is this force in us, round us. Yeah. And, and now we have to start dealing with righteousness well, what's, and Paul's conversation What about sin that. has done is taken this tool that God has given to people that they could use to approach righteousness and it's hijacked it and then um, made things worse, actually. So the law doesn't have the power to transform a human heart. That's kind of Paul's argument. Right. But, if, but, but the law is still useful. I mean, it reveals sin and it shows sin. But what Paul sees now is that this useful tool of the law, when it's hijacked by the power of sin, now that tool is used like against us. It's bringing death. So is the yes. law bad? No. Right. Are the works of the law bad? No. Paul would say the works of the law are what we all want people to do in a society or in a community that functions well. And so the way he then sees God removing us from this problem that the good tool of the law has been hijacked and used against us by the power of sin is that this righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law. Mm -hmm. Well, now we have a problem. So what did God give? Well, God gave the law and then God just knocked the law down. But no, in verse 21, it's been manifested apart from the law in Jesus, even though the law and the prophets bear witness to it. And then in chapter four, He's going to tell the story about Abraham who has faith and it's counted to him as, as righteousness, righteousness before the law is written because Correct. Abraham comes before and Moses. And before his circumcision as well. So what, yes. what Paul's trying to show is uh, before the law is given, the righteousness of faith is clearly in the mind of God. Mm -hmm. Through the law, the law and the prophets witness to the righteousness of faith, i.e. the event that's going to be Jesus, mm -hmm. so that we can also... Um, live into the righteousness of God that's revealed apart from the law, but witnessed to by the law and the prophets so that we can actually be free from this powerful tyrant named sin. And we can be dead to sin and alive to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I think a great place for us to end is to look at verse 31 of chapter three. And here's what Paul says. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. And again, what we're finding here is, is that quite frankly, in the church, when I stepped into faith as a preteen boy, and was kind of discipled. It was as though the law was just thrown aside, wasn't needed, was dead, gone. And now we're just justified by faith and just move on with Jesus and leave. That's not what Paul is saying at all. What Paul's talking about is the law still has a work to do. And if it's combined by faith, it's something that actually shows the greatness and the good of God. And so is there one final parting thought, Peter, that you have yeah. before we exit? Yeah, I think this kind of idea that instead of, um, I think it's a misreading to think that Paul thinks what's great about faith, what's great about Jesus and the gospel is that it frees us from the law entirely. Mm -hmm. But in fact, what we're going to see is Paul brings back the notion of law in various ways. So in verse 27, we see him using this phrase, the law of faith. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that wouldn't make a lot of sense if you're talking to any number of a certain form of Protestant theologian. Right. So what Paul actually sees is that this faith manifest apart from the law allows us to do what the law always wanted done. And so now we are subject to a law, but it's the law of faith or what he'll elsewhere call the law of the spirit of life. Yes. So there is actually um, an ethics. There's a vision of life. There's a call to become a particular kind of people, but it doesn't work the way Tara did. Right. In other words, there's not 613 laws where you're having to follow them and check the boxes. Now it's the spirit of life or a spirit of faith that's going to bring about that work in us and give us the power and the authority to do it. Well, Peter, I think that's it for our time together. So I'm going to say a brief prayer. So let's pray. Well, Jesus, thank you for who you are to us. God, I'm praying over each and every one of us that our minds and our hearts would be open to what the Apostle Paul is trying to teach us through the inspired scripture and through the book of Romans. So Lord, help us to be a group of people that don't just hear the word, but we actually live in to the word that we're learning. So Jesus, thank you again for who you are to us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you and thank you for being with us. And we look forward to seeing you at tomorrow's video for day number three.